Welcome everyone to our spring native plant sale uh, preview. And we will be talking today about uh, how to strategize when you're um, purchasing plants through our uh, native plant sale um, so that you choose the right plants for your garden. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce our two presenters today, uh, Carrie Hackney and Kim Matsushino. Uh, they will be uh, cluing us in on how to choose the correct plants today. Uh, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you too. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, let me just get my screen up here. Okay. Okay. Look good. Looks great. Cool. All right. Uh, so I'm Kim at Sushino. I'm the Habitat at Home Coordinator and Presented with me is Carrie Hackney. Um, she is our urban, gosh, <laughs> it's changed so much, but you go ahead, Carrie. <laughs> urban Habitat Restoration Manager. Yes. Uh, so she is our plant guru today. Um, so let's get started. So I just have some logistic information for the plant sale. Um, if you are a Tucson Audubon member, there has been some confusion on the membership code and that's my fault, I apologize. Um, so just enter member 2022, all caps, um, when you check out in the promo code and that will give you your 10% off. Um, if you are a Tucson Audubon volunteer with us, if you use um, TAS staff in all caps, that will get you your volunteer discount and I can put that in the chat as well. Um, we do have a promo going on this time. So if you purchase hundred dollars or more worth of native plants, you will receive Martha Pyle's A Desert Backyard Journal for free. And that will automatically be added to your cart as far as I, I know from the, the shop folks. Um, for dates, April 28th through the 23rd, the plant sale will be live online. Um, so you have all week to purchase your plants. April 27th, um, Bernie from Nighthawk Natives will be delivering all the plants that were ordered. Um, and Carrie and I will be putting them into groups and orders to get ready for you guys to pick up. Uh, so pick up is April 28th through 30th. So that's Thursday, Friday, Saturday at our nature shop on University. So the hours are Thursday and Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And if these dates don't work for you, um, just shoot us an email and we can we can make something work. Um, and then April 30th, which is the last day of plant pickups, we are having a book signing event with Rich Bailowitz, who is the co-author of Southeast Arizona Butterflies and also the Damselflies and Dragonflies of Sonora and Arizona. Both awesome books. You can buy them um, in the nature shop or online at the nature shop. But so he'll be here the 30th from noon to two, just signing copies, talking to people. Awesome guy, really nice, um, super knowledgeable about butterflies. Uh, so because of this book signing event, we decided to base this presentation off of butterfly habitat and creating butterfly habitat um, and the plants that would best provide certain aspects of habitat. Uh, so I just want to do a little preview of what um, is required in a butterfly habitat. So most importantly, you need to provide for both the adults and the caterpillars. So for adult butterflies, it's really important for food that you have floral resources. Um, a lot of times the caterpillars are specific to what plants they will consume. However, adults are pretty opportunistic in that they will mostly feed on any nectar source that is available, so, which is great because you can just plant a bunch of plants and they'll be super happy. Uh, water, water is important, especially here in the desert. Um, a puddler is required for them. Um, I have a slide on the puddler and how to make one coming up. Um, protection, so adults need protection from the elements. Uh, so this is like wind, rain, um, and then anthropogenic um, hazards mainly pesticide use, uh, shelter and places to raise young. So this is host plants primarily. 
Um, so where the adults lay the eggs and then the caterpillars hatch and eat that plant until they are old enough to pupate. Um, and then habitat for larvae and or caterpillars, uh, pretty basic. They just need a larval host plant and then protection from pesticides. So just a little more in depth. Uh, so floral resources, the things you want to consider when planting for butterflies is that, um, like I said earlier, adults are pretty, pretty open to what they'll, they'll get their nectar from. So it's just important to have flowering plants. Um, and you do want to plant a diversity of plants um, just because that'll have, you know, just have more resources for the butterflies available. Um, and then when you're planting, you want to plant in clumps. So large splashes of color in your yard will track them when they're flying over. Um, and then it also allows them a shorter foraging distance between uh, food resources. So this is a puddler. Um, so the main thing is that you don't want to have them be wet. So if you have just some nice brown available, if you just make some puddles once in a while out there, they will just sit there and drink from the puddle. Or you can also make your own, uh, which is really easy to do. I, I've used it by just using an old plant saucer, putting some nice sand in the bottom and some large rocks and then just keeping it moist. And um, that gives them places to stand and drink without having to get their wings wet, which is not good. Um, and it also gives the the nutrients that they need from the wet uh, sand and rocks. And just be sure you don't let it stand for too long just to prevent mosquitoes. Oops. All right, and then protection. So protection from the elements um, on rainy days or days that have high winds, uh, butterflies tend to wait out the bad weather um, on the underside of leaves, trees, shrubs, or vines. Um, they also like to take breaks from the day um, just to have a little snooze. Um, and they will primarily do that in trees and shrubs, which uh, shelter your yard from the wind, which makes it easier for the butterflies to explore your yard. Um, and then most importantly is protection from pesticides, uh, primarily neonicotinoids. Um, research has found that the higher well, it's pretty obvious that the higher amount of neonicotinoids found in a garden, the lesser amount of um, butterflies you will find. Um, so that's that's proving to be a detrimental uh, killer of butterfly populations. Um, so the best thing to do is just buy plants that you know aren't treated with neonicotinoids or pesticides. Um, so all the plants that we have for sale here are definitely not treated with anything. So they are ready to go. I mean, if you're ever wondering if they are, it's just a good idea to, to check with the local nursery. Um, and lastly, shelter and places to raise young. Um, so uh, providing basking sites, even though it seems really hot, um, butterflies do like to just sit out and warm up on some nice rocks. So just placing some nice flat rocks in your yard is great for them. Um, and then host plants. So the best way to kind of get or figure out what plants you wanna plant or what butterflies you wanna attract is to figure out what host plant that the caterpillars eat. So throughout this presentation, we've put um, larval host plant species into each plant that we have. So if you're looking to attract specific butterflies, um, it's great just to look up what their caterpillars eat. And that's the, probably the best way to, to get those specific butterflies into your yard. Um, I think this is Carrie. We're gonna learn how to plant with Carrie. Do you just want me to play it, Carrie? Yeah, we might wanna turn the audio down if we can though. Oh yeah, okay, let's find out. There you go. All right. I'm at the Patent Center, Thompson Parcel. All right. So, the first step 
obviously, to, to dig your hole. Um, luckily, it was in Patagonia, so it was great soil, a little bit different than what you might find here in Tucson. Uh, we, when I dig the hole, I tend to put all the, the soil on the downslope side because um, then you have it ready to, to make your berm and make a nice little water harvesting basin. And then the easiest way to, to make sure your hole is deep enough is just to simply place the plant in the pot right in your hole and see where you're at. It's good to make sure you have uh, about a half inch extra depth so that you do have a nice watering basin. Uh, we like to pre-water our holes. Uh, this checks for infiltration rates to make sure it's a well-draining hole for the right plant. Uh, but it also makes sure that when you put the plant in the ground that all the soil around it isn't just immediately sucking out any moisture that was in that container plant. And then we just make a nice wide basin, scraping the soil around the sides. Uh, you wanna make sure your soil is level with the root crown. And then you tamp it in to get rid of any air pockets. This helps protect it against frost, um, but also from any critters that might like to eat the roots. And that's our planting tip. All right, so we're gonna jump right in with plants. Um, first up, we have our deer grass. Uh, native grasses are a great way to provide the, the shelter or the nesting requirements for butterflies. Um, the muley grasses, this family, they're excellent larval hosts as well to a wide suite of butterflies. And I always try to add a muley grass to a yard um, if someone is particularly interested in pollinator habitat. Deer grass specifically is, is a nice large streamside grass that does require a little bit more irrigation, uh, but it can reach up to five feet tall and four feet wide. It does well planted in some shade, um, and it also adds a lovely textural contrast to the landscape. And if there are any fountain grasses in your yard or in your neighborhood, this is a great replacement for it. So grasses are wind pollinated and don't produce nectar. Um, so the, this grass doesn't make it into my bloom calendar, um, although it does flower most of the year. So the remainder of the plants in this presentation are arranged by their bloom period as one of the goals with pollinator gardens is try to, to select plants that will give you year round blooms or fill out certain periods. Um, so once you make a bloom calendar, you can just list all the species that you have, and then it helps you identify any gaps in nectar resources and help you select plants um, to fill those gaps. And it's always best to aim for at least two to three plants blooming at any given time of the year. Um, it's also worth noting that bloom periods are extended when they're on irrigation, so the time frame mentioned for each plant are just a good baseline to start with. Uh, so we're going to kick off our bloom calendar with springs. This is our spring plant sale. So first up, we have our, our lovely iconic penstemon. Uh, so on the right there, we have the penstemon perii, um, which is the most common native penstemon around Tucson. It's popular hillsides and canyons, so it does well in a, a wide variety of solar exposures, and it is the easiest species to grow here. Um, they are short-lived perennials, about three to five years, but it's a prolific reseeder, so it can create a meadow of penstemon. Um, it's, it's great. A lot of them are eaten by rabbits, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, if there's, uh, I don't know if there's many in this presentation that are um, for rabbits, but if, if they pop into my head, I'll mention them. Um, but we, we do recommend caging as well, it can help with that. Um, so pensamins are great, short-lived, they're prolific reseeder, and they can create a meadow. Um, so plant it in a group uh, with a variety of plants to ensure there's some diversity. Uh, there is a larval host for allet moss, geometrid moss, and clear, clearwig moss. And then on the left, we have uh, our sh nice showy firecracker pensamen. Uh, this one's found at a slightly higher elevation as it's native to our desert mountains. So it'll do well with a little bit of shade. Uh, the red tubular flowers are quite showy 
to make a, a wonderful accent plant. Um, it has a slightly longer bloom period than the other pentamins, so it's a, a reliable food source, a nectar source for hummingbirds. And then the last pentamin in the set uh, is the desert pentamin. Uh, this one is one of my personal favorites. It's just a stunning addition um, with its pink to ruby to purple flowers. Uh, it is native to the higher elevations of the Catalinas and the Rincon Mountains. So again, a little bit of shade would be beneficial. Um, and it does provide all the same habitat benefits as the previous pentamin. Uh, if there's, if I could only recommend one plant for you to plant in your yard, uh, it would be the creosote. This shrub has a huge draw for insects um, and thus breeding birds. Uh, it's associated with over 60 spe species of insects, uh, supports 20 species of generalist native bees, and even more uh, generalist. So it just creates a feeding frenzy for our birds. Uh, it provides great habitat cover for a variety of wildlife. Uh, they're very tough. They do great with full sun and are actually quite frost hardy as well, down to five degrees. Uh, they're one of the most drought tolerant species and can do well with minimal water. Uh, they're a great match to accent the forms of agaves and yuccas. Uh, they can be a little bit tricky to get established, so uh, we offer them in the five gallon pots and they're a little bit more forgiving that way and you'll have, have much better odds. Next, we have the banana yucca. This plant is a, a stunning accent plant and is one of the hardiest plants known in the landscaping industry for our region. Uh, they do well in both summer and winter extremes, quite cold hardy. It does like well-drained soils that are coarse uh, and it does have the best form if planted in full sun. This plant has a very specialized relationship with its pollinator, which is the yucca moth. Uh, which is pretty cool and interesting to watch. Um, the moths actually emerge from their cocoons just as the plants start to flower in the spring, and the moths even match the color of the flower. They're, they're pretty darn cute. Next up, we have the desert spoon. That's another great accent, and the foliage has a nice bluish hue to it. Um, it flowers a little bit more frequently than agave, sending up flowering stalks every couple of years. And these stalks will just get covered in thousands of tiny white green flowers. And they attract bees, butterflies, moths, and even hummingbirds. Uh, it does best in full sun and extremely drought tolerant and cold hardy. So when most people think of, of pollinator garden, uh, large shrubs aren't typically the first plant that comes to mind. Um, however, if your yard has a space, they're a great addition as they are larval hosts and you don't have to worry about planting uh, multiple plants as Kim described earlier. So one, one large shrub can meet the foraging requirements of, of many individual caterpillars. So as soon as I see my, my shrub strips of leaves, um, I love to go out there and count how many I, I can find. And when you do have an abundance of caterpillars like that, it's extremely attractive uh, foraging habitat for birds, especially nesting birds. Uh, the dense shrubs also are great at providing the element of shelter for butterflies, so another one there. Um, this particular shrub, boring saltbush, uh, is a habitat star if you've got the space. It has a huge draw for shelter and is a prime nesting site for ground nesting birds. Uh, it's also, it will attract rabbits, so that might be out for some folks, but also lizards as well. The seeds are loved by towhees, sparrows, and quail. If you have any erosion on your property, the root system is perfect for stabilizing soil. Um, it's best used in a, a backdrop or a, a partial hedge around the property boundary as it can spread quite easily. Um, so you wanna keep an eye out for any unwanted plants. Uh, it's extremely drought tolerant and cold hardy. It stretches in its native range all the way to Canada. Um, so it does great in a lot of environments, but it does do best planted in full sun. Uh, next we have our, our charming little Angelina, Angelita Daisy. 
but it's found in meadows and woodland edges at higher elevations. Um, so keep that in mind when you're planting it. It's going to want uh, some shade, especially in the afternoon when it's when we have our scorching sun. It's very compact and has a form that works well as an accent in a pollinator garden, or it's a great plant uh, if you have a container garden that you're working on. Uh, it's got a nice long bloom period as well, all the way from April to September, so it's a, a great addition as a nectar source. Uh, next we have a Blackfoot Daisy. This one's another cutie. Uh, it has a wide variety of habitats from Arizona to Kansas to Mexico, so this wide distribution makes it a favorite of many species. It's a showy and cute ground cover with an abundance of white little flowers. Uh, that will accent anything in your yard. Uh, despite its delicate appearance, it is quite hardy. And it, it's a favorite of many pollinators, um, as well as granivorous birds that like to munch on the seeds. And this one takes a lot of pruning. Um, as they can get quite large, you can go ahead and, and prune it back in the winter. Next, we have marigold. This guy does well in some of the toughest places to get plants established. Uh, it can handle full sun, but it doesn't tolerate heavy watering or slow draining soils. I found that the less attention that I give this plant in my yard, the better it does, um, even in a location where it receives full sun all day. Uh, it's a great accent with the soft green leaves and the cute daisy-like flowers, and it does have another significant bloom period again. And it attracts bees, butterflies, and moss. It is a bit short-lived, um, but it will reseed prettily, and it's a great seed to distribute along the sidewalks in your neighborhood. Next, we have tufted evening primrose. Uh, this is found, again, in a wide variety of habitats, so it will do well in most places throughout your property. Uh, this one's a night bloomer. Uh, it opens at sunset and stays open till the mid-morning. So when you walk out in your yard in the morning, this will be the first thing that catches your eye. Uh, it's great in a grouping with other plants. It's a little bit smaller, so you want to keep it uh, towards the front or along the edges near your path. Uh, it's pollinated by the sphinx moss, sphinx moss, while white lime sphinx moss and flower moss are using the plant as a larval food source. Um, it's also visited by a number of bees and butterflies for its nectar and even produces seed for goldfish juice. Next up, we have our hop seed bush. I love the close look at those flowers because they're so hard to notice unless you get up close like that. Uh, hop, hop bush is a fast growing shrub that can get quite large. Uh, in response to irrigation. I see it all over Sabino Canyon, um, where it's about three to four feet tall, but once it's on irrigation, it can get pretty enormous from six to 10 to even 12 feet tall and wide. Uh, if you've got an oleander in your yard, this is a great replacement. It's a native plant. It's also uh, fast growing, so it, it gets you that replacement height uh, pretty quickly. It's larval host to scented silk moth and the slug caterpillar moth. Uh, this shrub provides lots of other habitat ben benefits from nesting opportunities to producing an abundance of seeds for the northern cardinals and the periloxia to munch on. Uh, it's a favorite spot at the Mason Center for a variety of life, wildlife to take shelter. And I've seen rabbits, coyotes, um, and lots of birds hanging out underneath there. So all around great, great food plant, great nectar plant, and great, great shelter plant. Fragrant bush is one of our absolute favorites at Tucson Audubon. Um, it's an extremely fragrant plant. Uh, two weeks after, after the rain, it gets covered in these little adorable white flowers, um, and they're starting to bloom now if, if you see them around. They're vanilla scented flowers. They're great by, by sidewalks. Um, very sweet smelling desert scent. Uh, they're a strong nectar producer and visited by bees, uh, hummingbirds, butterflies, and moss. They're also an abundant producer of seeds and the most reliable way to get the lesser goldfinches in your yard um, without purchasing nitro thistle seed. Uh, it's very versatile and will do great in shade. It's got a lovely vase-like form. 
um, which makes it a great accent plant to anchor beds, but also a great companion planting uh, with small shrubs planted right at its base. Uh, next up, we have uh, wild fuchsia. This is a, a charming small shrub uh, that is a crowd pleaser in any yard and a great addition to fill out your bloom calendar for your fall months. Um, the red tubular flowers are a huge draw for hummingbirds. Uh, as nectar starts to become kind of scarce in the fall, this plant is in full bloom, attracting late season butterflies such as whites and sulfurs. Uh, the flowers are also a favorite snack of tortoises, and they're also edible to humans if you ever want to try them. Um, plant, it does like a little bit of shade, um, and then you should be prepared for it to die back in the winter, but it's a cute addition. Uh, Menadora longiflorus, it's a nice compact subshrub with long tubular yellow flowers. Uh, the name long of flora actually translates to long flower. Uh, it's extremely cold hardy for any folks outside of Tucson. It will do best planted in a little bit of shade. Uh, it's a strong nectar producer with fragrant flowers that attract butterflies, moths, and hummingbirds, and another great fall bloomer. All right, next up we have a uh, turpentine. Uh, Turpentine produces the profusion of yellow flowers in the fall. Um, it can produce them in quantities that it can pretty much obscure any foliage, so it's absolutely covered in, in these little yellow flowers. Um, for most blooms and best forms, they in full sun and well-draining soils. Uh, the abundance of nectar-rich blooms in the fall makes it reliable and a popular nectar source for many butterflies, including the great purple hair streak, for which it's a favorite. Very cute butterfly. Uh, it also produces an abundance of seed for carnivorous birds. All right, this year we have a uh, sort of rain lily in, offered in our sale, and this is one of the hardest, uh, hardiest rain lilies, and it's native to Texas. Uh, they do require a little bit more consistent watering, but if you've got a location in your yard that gets a little bit more moisture, maybe like the spray from a water feature or the discharge from your air conditioning condensate, uh, it's a good, good place for this. Um, a little bit of shade will be beneficial, and these plants are also a nice fall bloomer and winter bloomer that attracts bees and butterflies. Pretty hard to get flowering plants in the winter. This is our, our wolfberry for this sale. Uh, there's many species of wolfberry native to the Sonoran Desert, and they are all pretty similar in appearance and habitat value. Uh, the Andersoni has slightly lighter bark, and the leaves are a little bit more narrow. It's a very versatile and hardy plant, although it tends to drop its leaves during periods of drought, so placing accordingly. Um, I have mine tucked away in the corners of my yard, so it's a bit obscured by other plants. Um, however, the habitat benefits make it extremely worthwhile. In addition to being the larval host for several species of moths, it's the favorite, favorite nectar source of queens, monarchs, and dusky wing butterflies. Uh, hummingbirds also love those tubular flowers. Uh, the spiny branches make for excellent cover in nesting sites, and the little red berries are favored by quail and doves um, and a nice snack while you're working in your yard. So one of the easiest ways to fill out your bloom calendar is to utilize plants that bloom throughout the majority of the year. Uh, and Gooding verbena is one of those plants. It's one of my absolute favorites for a fallen pollinator bed because it's such a strong nectar producer and it attracts uh, a wide, wide suite of pollinators, especially butterflies. Uh, it's pretty hardy, does well in a variety of environments, uh, but with everything a little bit of afternoon shade during the warmest parts of the year go a long ways. Uh, the species is short-lived, but it will reseed readily. Um, so it's great for a meadow or an area that you've allowed to get a bit wild. Uh, another long bloomer are the globe mallows, and we have three of them are offering in this plant sale this year. Uh, so first up is the colored globe mallow. Uh, it's found in a wide variety of environments and it's quite hardy. 
that looks best in a group planting. Um, it can get a little scraggly during the winter months, uh, so accenting it with other plants is a great aesthetic. It will reseed and spread, um, and it will thrive with minimal irrigation. Uh, it's a member of the hibiscus family and can flower most of the year. The bloom color varies um, from orange to white to pink to lavender or even red. Uh, bees absolutely love this plant, and I love to, to check all my flowers to see if there's any bees napping in them. Um, but as it's a strong nectar producer, it also attracts many other pollinators, um, such as butterflies um, and even nectar robbers, such as verdans. Uh, uh, if you want the painted lady or skipper butterflies, it's their larval food host. Um, and for the moths, one of my favorite moths, uh, it's the larval host for the bird dropping moth. Google image that if you haven't. <laughs> Uh, next up, we have the Fendler's Globe Mallow. Uh, these are the species that are native to the Catalina and the Rink Pond. Um, they're a little bit thicker than the colored Globe Mallows, and they do take a little bit longer to establish. Uh, the flowers are mostly reddish orange, but they can also be that lavender or purple color as well. Um, and all the same, same habitat value as the colored Globe, globe Mallow. Right, next up, we have the Kalichi globe mallow, and it's named that for a reason. Uh, if you have patches of Kalichi in your yard, this plant is a great fit for those tough soils. Uh, the species is primarily orange in color, and it's most the most common globe mallow found in the Catalina Mountains. So Mexican honeysuckle it, uh, is a, a nice change from a lot of the desert plants. It has a very lush evergreen aesthetic. It's got those lovely orange tubular flowers. Um, it can reach two to three feet tall and just as wide. I love to replace bougainvilleas with this plant. Um, it's a great accent with those evergreen leaves uh, throughout the year. And it will do best in the warmer microclimates around your house, so a south-facing wall. Uh, the blooms are sporadic throughout the year. Uh, but usually present during the winter, which is great because you need as many blooms during the winter as you can. Um, hummingbirds love this plant, and it's a nice change up in your hummingbird habitat with its with those orange flowers. All right, we have uh, two agaves at this year's plant sale, um, and they are hands down the best agaves that you can plant if you're wanting to create habitat for bats. Uh, Perry's agave is native to the Santa Rita's and the Huachuca Mountains, so it's happy with a little bit of afternoon shade since it's from those higher elevations, but otherwise it does pretty well with sun. Um, agaves are great in any landscape and a great way to accent and maintain visual interest, especially during the winter months when there's not much in bloom or plants are dormant. Um, when, when the agaves do bloom, their flowers are just dripping with nectar and attract a wide suite of pollinators. Uh, their flowering stalks are a great purchase for birds and allow you to get some pretty stunning photos. Uh, but the stalks are also great um, once the once they have passed. We have a little picture of her. <laughs> uh, they can be cut down and used for, for habitat uh, for native bees. So they'll tunnel in there and, and make some great native bee nesting sites. All right, and then finally we have uh, Palmer's agave, which is pretty similar to Perii in terms of benefits for wildlife and habitat use. It does get a little bit larger and it's native to slightly lower elevations, so it can take a little bit more sun uh, and be planted just about anywhere in your yard. It's a larval host to the giant skipper uh, and the flowers are, are so nectar rich that it'll attract sphinx moths, hummingbirds, and even orioles. Sorry, I like, yeah, I was, I was like, I feel like we forgot to put in Damianita. And I was like, I feel like I remember making that slide. Do you want to talk about? Is it on the plant sale this year? Yeah. Is it? Maybe not. Oh, God. No, it's not. Sorry. I don't know why I did that. Okay. I wanted to see Rue. Yes. <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, disregard. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Um, 
So those are our plants. Um, and if you are interested in the Habitat at Home program, so you plan all these plants and you're like, what do I do now? You can register for the Habitat at Home program. Um, even if you don't buy plants, you can still register for the Habitat at Home program. Um, so if you're not all familiar with the Habitat at Home program, it, it is a self-guided, um, pretty much like a certification, like your National Wildlife Federation's um, Habitat Certification Program for your backyard, but a Tucson version. So you're supporting Tucson Audubon and getting all the resources that will work for your yards here in, in Tucson. Um, so you can register online at tucsonaudubon.org backslash habitat. Um, there's a one-time fee, $35 for Audubon members and then $45 for non-Audubon members. And that gets you your, your metal yard sign a nice manual with a step-by-step -step guide on how to create habitat in your backyard at varying levels from simple container gardens that work really well for apartment dwellers all the way up to our cardinal level, which includes um, water harvesting um, and all sorts of great things, nest boxes. Um, so there's different levels for everyone's needs and if you just wanna be as inclusive as possible with this program. Um, yeah, so, and if you have questions about the program, feel free to email me, which we have our emails up here on the next slide. Um, we do have a new Habitat a la carte menu that we've added. So after you have created your monarch or butterfly habitat, we have stickers for you. So if you join the program, we have nine different a la carte menu options. So if you are super into moths or you're super into bats, you can create a bat habitat or a moth habitat in your backyard and get that recognition sticker as well. Um, and then we also have for Habitat at Home members, the pleasure of the restoration crew. So if you just moved here, you don't really know where to start. Um, you just want some advice. Carrie and crew um, are available to help you out. And we have different levels of um, evaluations you can do, she can come out, um, and they even will implement their design. You know, Carrie, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just feel free to email us. Um, we do have sample evaluations available if you think you might be interested, but just want a little bit more information, just reach out. Thanks. And then it is also Birdathon time. Um, so Birdathon is a way for Tucson Audubon to raise money. Um, it's like a walkathon, but we bird for the whole day if we want, like a 24 hour period. Um, so Carrie came up with an awesome idea to create a Birdathon team for Habitat at Home. Um, so our team name is called the Habitat at Home Ornithological Assessors, just like a little play on HOA. That's all I could think of. Um, Carrie, do you wanna promote us? <laughs> Yeah, so um, what we're looking for at this point is we could use a few more yards to stop and bird at. Um, so we're traveling all over Southeast Arizona. We'll be in Patagonia, we'll be in Rio Rico and Green Valley and also the Tucson area. Um, so if you've got a yard and you wanna, if you have us over and bird together, um, we'll be stopping by for about 15 to 30 minute time frame. Um, it's also a great chance if you are buying plants at this sale today, to be like, hey, where should I put this? And we'll help you out. Um, and, and donations are also always welcome. Uh, but yeah, we, we mostly just love to bird with you all and, and see the awesome habitat you've created uh, and celebrate that. Thank you. I'm putting the link to our um, Birdathon page in the chat if you want to check us out or check out any other teams that are are going out this year. Um, I think that's it. And we're saving some time for questions if we have any. Awesome, thanks so much, Kim and Carrie. Um, I did see uh, Sarah put in the chat um, and then I also looked at the list. Damia Nita is on the plant list this year. So I don't know if you wanna take a second. Well to done. Say about that. <laughs> I have a slide <laughs> for that. Oh, wait, yeah. So hold on, let me find it again. Let me find Rue. Okay. 
So, Aww. do you That's have great. <laughs> so Dominica is great. It's very evergreen. Um, it does have those. Uh, putting me a bit on the spot here since I didn't prepare. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. It's it's very hardy. Um, it's it's extremely hardy and does well in a great variety of environments. Um, I, I'm not sure it's bloom period, but yeah, I, I see it covered in pollinators quite frequently, and it always looks fantastic. Um, so it, it's a great plant. Mine just started to bloom profusely. Um, yeah, it smells delicious. Yeah, it's awesome. I love that plant. It is. It is pretty small. It's fairly compact. So yeah, one by one, not too much bigger than that. As you can see, Rue for scale. <laughs> yeah, she was out sniffing it when they bloomed last week. So let's take a picture. Um, okay, Lisa, you had a question. Did you want to unmute yourself, or uh, I see you put a question in the chat? Um, I, I I did both, but I'll um. Yeah, go do ahead. I have to be uh, sign up for a habitat to be able to purchase plants? No, not at all. Anyone can buy plants. Okay. I mean, not that I won't, because I'm very, <laughs> I am working on my own little habitat here, but awesome. um, not an official one. <laughs> but um, great, thank you. And um, and then I can just go to the website that you had there for to purchase them. Yeah, yes. I'll send a, a link directly to the actual plant portion. So I just, yeah, I just threw that link in the in the chat. Awesome. Actually, yeah, that goes directly to our nature shop uh, plant sale. Okay. Page. So from there, you can purchase all of them online and then pick up April twenty eighth to the thirtieth at the nature shop. Twenty eighth to the thirtieth. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you for that question. That was yeah. good to clarify that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Betty, did you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Right. Um, I think I'm unmuted, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we can okay. Um, my question is, uh, you brought up creosote, and I've got uh, quite a bit of creosote on my property. I, I have been told that creosote puts out a kind of like a plant, uh, anti-plant uh, 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 chemical in its from its roots and so it doesn't like other plants don't like to be around creosote very much is that true or not true you're not familiar with that Jonathan yeah, I'm happy to take this one <laughs> um, so yeah a lot of people think that creosote has what's called allelopathic chemicals that it releases from the roots most people that I've talked to say that if that's the case, it's barely the case. And that really out in the desert, the reason that there's not a lot of stuff growing underneath is because creosote roots can just suck water a lot more effectively than most other plants. Mm. But if you're growing things in your own landscape, chances are if you're using irrigation at all, then there's enough water availability to have other plants growing immediately underneath the creosote, just like every winter, under the creosotes is where you have the highest density of the little belly annual wildflowers. And that's because they're getting shade and they're happier there. So as long as there's water available, you don't have to worry about uh, creosote poisoning your other plants due to the supposed okay. Thank you. Sure thing. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That's really interesting. I hadn't heard that before. Um, yeah, Wettstein G, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, a great presentation, by the way. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it's similar to the creosote issue. I have eucalyptus trees in my backyard and not much seems to want to volunteer underneath them. And then also harvester ants. I have a real issue with harvester ants. I come out and def defoliate things. Is there any suggestions on how to work with that? I'm not super familiar with growing things under eucalyptus since they're not native. I haven't studied that a whole lot. Um, but something we can try and look into. Um, I know other locations, some of the houses that we've worked with have had giant eucalyptus trees and lots of things growing underneath without any seeming difficulty. Um, so it might be something else site specific that's going on. Um, Without at least some photos, it's a little hard to say. Uh, 
harvester ants, I don't have a great answer for that one. Maybe Carrie or Kim have come up with something. Um, a lot of times, well, mostly the harvester ants aren't going out and collecting a lot of leaves off of other plants. Um, leaf cutter ants do that almost exclusively. Uh, yeah, there's not a great way to, to get rid of harvester ants if they're in a place where they're not directly interacting with you or pets. Um, they're a great food source for horny toads and flickers and some other things. Uh, don't bother trying to dig up their nest. I had a roommate that tried to do that once uh, as part of his PhD work and about six feet down and eight feet across, he finally gave up because he still hadn't gotten to the queen's chamber. Um, and then we had a giant hole in the yard. It was great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I probably wouldn't. Yeah, I have no desire to, to relocate them or try to eradicate them. I'd re like to work around them or at least find a, yeah. a, a balance for that. You know, I, yeah, like I said, I don't, I don't have a great answer. They, okay. they might occasionally strip a plant. They're going to go for what's got the most moisture or greenest usually. Um, so planting things nearby to them that are, uh, have thicker leaves that they can't just readily cut, like, um, red yucca and agaves and cactus and that sort of thing um, will will help limit them a little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a, an easy answer on that one. No problem, thank you. Thanks for that question and for helping out, Jonathan. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I saw um, everything in the chat looks like it's been answered. Um, thank you, Jonathan and Kim. Any other questions that haven't been answered? I actually have a question. Um, so I can't actually plant things in the ground because I rent and I have a small patio. Um, what if any of these plants are good for container gardens? In the shade or full sun? Uh, so I my patio faces east, so it gets morning sun, afternoon shade. Oh, great. Um, I'd say the Angelita daisy would be adorable in there. Um, along with some Goodings Urbana. Um, and then, yeah, you could do the, the Christectinia New Mexicana um, that popped up at the end. Awesome. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right. Well, if there are no other questions, then um, I want to thank everyone for uh, for coming today. Um, just a reminder that the plant sales the 28th, or sorry, pickup is the 28th through the 30th. Plant sales already live. I put that link in the chat so you can go on there and look through all the plants uh, and purchase them online and then pick up at the end of the month um, at our nature shop. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in contact with Carrie or Kim. Um, they're, they're happy to help guide you uh, in your selections. Um, and a huge thank you to both of them for the presentation today. Uh, a big thank you to Jonathan as well for helping answer some of those uh, tough questions. Um, and we're just glad that you all came out and joined us. Again, this recording will be available uh, hopefully later today, tomorrow at the latest. Um, so thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was really informative. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank Thanks you. for coming, Lisa. <laughs> Bye. Bye.